This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Now we're going to look at some typical internal control systems. Remember, these are only typical. Uh, companies can come to very many different arrangements uh, for the implementation of adequate internal control. I will start with the purchases system. And you can <coughs> excuse me, break down a purchase transaction into first of all placing the order and then you receive the goods uh, and then you receive the invoice and then you'll pay. And that, that's a whole of a, you might think at any rate, is a whole of a purchases system. What we want in all of these systems is, is, is a completely kind of watertight uh, uh, chain, if you like, sometimes called an audit trail, between the start and the end. Okay. So if I was the auditor and I went and I saw a, a copy order, I ought to know that essentially one of, one of the endpoints of, of that transaction, and it could take weeks to complete, is that there will be a payment going to the supplier. So, so fairly obviously, any order which will to trace through uh, the goods received note and the invoice, which will to, to trace the invoice, then going to the credit <coughs> of that supplier's account in the payable ledger, which will to see the cash leaving the bank account. Similarly, if I see an amount leaving the bank account and it has been described as payment to a supplier, I shall to track all the way back. I should see this payment has gone to that person's account in the payables ledger. I shall to see the invoice that has credited that. I shall to track that back to say, well, why have we accepted this invoice? It's because we have received goods. Why have we received goods? Because it was for an order that had been legitimately legitimately raised. So we should able to go all the way forward and all the way back, uh, a complete chain or what's called an audit trail from the start to the end, from the end to the start. And that's, and that's one of the things we'll be trying to achieve. And we want to make sure that at no point in this uh, pathway can a transaction, for example, go missing or a transaction be recorded incorrectly or perhaps a transaction even being duplicated. One of the things we're looking for in a purchaser system is how do we make sure we don't pay suppliers' invoices twice? You know, easy enough at home when you've got your electricity bill, uh, but what happens if every day a thousand invoices are coming in uh, from your suppliers? How do we guarantee that by accident one of them doesn't go around the, the system twice? Now, though this may uh, uh, appear to be the complete purchases system, you can argue it actually starts slightly earlier than this. Uh, uh, okay, we're saying here we're placing an order, but somewhere, uh, uh, someone should have decided who are going to be our suppliers. Uh, and uh, you can put in a really an extra kind of uh, step back, back here to, to find suppliers. You need suppliers who will supply goods of the right quality, who will supply goods when you need them, who will also be, of course, competitive. Uh, and, and sometimes the internal control system says, whenever you're placing an order, you must get a quotation from three suppliers. In some other situations, the internal control system is effectively saying, we have chosen this supplier because we've negotiated a really good discount from this supplier and all the supplies of a certain type of raw material is going to go from this person. If you don't have that sort of uh, control in, in here, the, the, if you like, the approval of suppliers, how do you know, for example, that the uh, people placing the purchase orders are simply not being careless? They don't bother getting a good deal. Or even worse, they send orders uh, to uh, friends, to people they have an association with, uh, who may even then give a kind of commission coming back. 
So before the transactions begin, the first ordering transaction begins, there you could certainly argue that there should be some approval process for uh, suppliers. Then, okay, let's assume we're over that. Let's say now we're ordering goods, ordinary uh, raw materials that we're going to be needing for production. Uh, who orders it? Why do they order it? What is the system to prevent you ordering too much or the system that's going to uh, cause you to keep running out of inventory? Because neither of those is kind of uh, too good. Uh, and generally speaking, what you have is going to be a purchase requisition This is probably going to be raised, uh, issued by someone in the warehouse. We hope that somebody in the warehouse is keeping an eye on inventory and it goes down and hits a, a kind of reorder level here. That's the trigger that, that we ought to think about raising an order. Uh, and that will then maybe go to a buyer's department who will raise a purchase order. So even at this uh, early stage, we have a, a kind of segregation of duties. The person in the warehouse sparks off the process, uh, but then it's somebody else who actually says, OK, I'll, I'll raise an order for this and it's going to go to that particular customer. One is checking on the other. Uh, it's going to be more difficult to place more orders than maybe you really need. What can go wrong here? Uh, one of the things that goes wrong or can go wrong is that the purchase order goes astray either with us it you know, falls down the back of a desk and never gets posted out or in the postal system <coughs> or perhaps when it gets to our supplier for some reason it, it, it gets uh, stuck in the supplier's system or gets mislaid and and if the goods don't come in then this can be very expensive for us it means we uh, can't produce uh, goods for sale means our customers are going to be inconvenienced. So one of the uh, uh, systems you have, and also you have to remember, of course, that we've ordered it. So so one of the, the, the standard sort of controls here is these purchase orders here uh, are going to be numbered. They're sequentially pre-numbered, so you'll be able to identify missing ones. And basically, one of these is probably going to uh, it's going to be filed, and one of them uh, is going to go off to the supplier. So one of them is filed. It's kept maybe in the purchasing department. It, it, <coughs> it'll be kept there in numerical order. We can check the numerical order is complete. And what we can do is, so what we should be doing, is when the order is fulfilled, when the goods come in, we in some way mark this order. You know, we've ordered the goods, we've got the goods, that's pretty good. But we should maybe be going through this file of orders every week uh, to look for what are, what are called long outstanding orders, orders that seem to have been lost, delayed or something, and which we will have to follow up either internally or with our suppliers. If you order goods and don't get the goods, then that's a problem. But by and large, we're waiting now. This, this order has gone to the uh, supplier. It's been a, an approved supplier and uh, uh, the like. Uh, probably the order has got some sort of authorization on it from the, uh, the buying department. And basically now we wait. And we're waiting for the goods to be received. So the next stage is in the warehouse, really. Uh, we receive the goods. And the sort of controls you'd expect to uh, have here is before you kind of almost accept the goods, you want to make sure they've been ordered. You want to make sure certainly the right goods have been uh, uh, delivered and you want to make sure the quality is okay. <coughs> so, so many, very often, there's actually a third copy of the order and the third copy of the order will go to the warehouse where it kind of waits for the goods coming in. So now when the goods come in, they'll have a delivery note with them. That delivery note should have our order number on it. 
and what we can do in here is essentially uh, to match. We want to match the goods received, the goods on the delivery note, with what was actually ordered. We'll be counting them, inspecting them and so on, and then if everything's okay we can be kind of putting them away uh, on the shelves and up updating the inventory records. So what we've got now, basically, sitting here, often stapled together, is uh, an order and probably we would raise what's called a goods receive note. And they would be, again, uh, uh, filed here. Uh, but there's no double entry yet. You don't do double entry upon this. You don't do double entry until you get an invoice but we've ordered the goods, we've got the goods, we're just waiting for the invoice to come. These may possibly sit in the warehouse, these matched goods received notes and orders and so on, but, but it's actually more likely probably to up the, to the accounts department. Where there'll be, the file will be kept. And the accounts department kind of waits, uh, and eventually an invoice will come in from a supplier uh, and what the accounts department should do before processes that invoice is to ensure uh, that it matches uh, to an approved order and the goods received notes. So now we could, if we like, pin together three documents. We've done the order, we've got the goods, and now we have the invoice. And what we'll be doing now with this invoice is essentially we're going to be crediting the supplier. What can go wrong at this point? Well, you might credit the wrong supplier. Uh, you might credit a supplier with the incorrect amount. Well, a common way of preventing these errors is that when these invoices come in from your suppliers that you list them on a, a purchase day book. Whoops. You list them on a purchase day book. A purchase day book is, is just, just what it says, it's just a list of invoices that you get in. And the purchase day book, you can add it up. It'll have a total on it. So you've got all the invoices, and then you have the total of all of those invoices. You credit the individual invoices to each supplier's account, and you credit this total to the control account. And what you have to do is to regularly reconcile the sum of the individual balances to the control account. So that if you forgot to credit one of these invoices to a particular supplier's account, it wouldn't reconcile anymore. That wouldn't pick up an error if uh, the error was that you credited the wrong supplier. What happens if we, we credit the, the incorrect supplier? Uh, well, what we hope to get from our suppliers is that we hope we get statements. Suppliers will send us statements in a way reminding us what we owe them. Uh, kind of giving us a little hint, maybe we'd like to pay now. And uh, what we should do is to reconcile the statements from suppliers uh, to these, to the, um, the, uh, the, the the supplier accounts and investigate anything which appears to be incorrect because it may imply that there, there has been a, a, a misposting. So we have, uh, we hope everything properly and correctly recorded in the supplier's account. A small danger, we, we might actually credit something twice to a supplier. The invoice might go around the system twice. And, and you know, one of the things we'd be liking to see at some point, either on posting to the supplier or on payment of the invoice, is to cancel the invoice. Market posted or market paid as appropriate. And now we wait to pay the suppliers. How should we pay the suppliers? When should we pay the suppliers? And again, there's an element of accounting policy in, in this. Some companies will say you always pay after 30 days. Some companies might say we never pay until 90 days is up. But there ought to be a kind of consistent policy 
uh, of paying suppliers so that you, you know, get discounts when you can and, and the like. What many companies do is they print out a list of all the payments, all, all the invoices outstanding, and maybe they age them. Invoices that we've owed for 30 days, invoices 30 to 60 days, and so on. And the financial controller maybe goes through these and kind of ticks the one uh, ticks the ones that have to be paid this time so that the the cash flow has been looked after you're not paying too many invoices yet you're not uh, irritating aggravating your suppliers by not paying enough many companies still will have before you you make the payment authorization they will want to see the invoice the goods received and the dispatch note kind of pinned together as absolute proof that this payment has been made for a, a legitimate expense for which we have received value. And then again, as I say, you might at this point mark the invoice paid uh, so that the uh, invoice can't possibly go, go round the system again. In a sales system, you can think of the transaction as happening uh, when you receive an order from a customer. Then you'll dispatch the goods and raise an invoice. Uh, then you're going to be crediting that as a, a kind of debit balance on their individual receivables account. You're going to follow it up to make sure they pay reasonably soon. And eventually we hope we're going to get the cash. So again, we should have this audit trail complete in here. Any order which we find as auditors uh, we should say there's an order, uh, assuming it's been approved, it should eventually end up with cash being received. And we should be able to track that all the way through uh, as we go through here uh, to uh, cash being received. How about that? Let's just get rid of that. Okay. Similarly, if you see cash coming in, cash coming into a business, uh, certainly cash appearing in the sales account, uh, or, or, or cash appearing uh, and, or on the debit of the uh, cash book and described as being received from a customer, you should say, well, they're saying that's coming from a customer paying us. Uh, and you should have track all, all the way back to saying, well, they're paying that money now because uh, they got those goods and that's because they ordered those goods. We should have to account, if you like, uh, for all of these receipts and, and the why they were received. Once again, we could argue that the four stages here, the transaction, actually is at a very important earlier stage here. And that is, uh, do we want these, these people as customers? Uh, there is no point in accepting orders, dispatching goods and sending invoices to people who may never pay. So what we should really have before we even say yes to our first order here is some sort of uh, credit reference. How do we know this new customer is credit worthy? What sort of credit limit should we set on their account? And generally speaking, credit limits are set initially pretty low. Uh, and then as you gain experience and begin to trust that customer, then they can be, be put up. So the first internal control or step is to obtain uh, information about their credit worthiness, their credit reference agencies. Uh, you can ask for a set of their latest financial statements to get an idea of the, the size of the company and the liquidity and so on. Uh, but you're taking quite a big risk if you don't do that. Then, then we get an order from the customer. And what we need to do with the order from uh, the customer is, is to compare that to the credit limit. Uh, we don't want to accept a you know a huge order of a uh, hundred thousand dollars if the credit limit is ten thousand. We might also want to uh, check if we have the stock. Uh, if somebody orders goods from us and we're not going to have those goods for maybe a month, it's probably good for long-term relations with that customer to tell them 
uh, and say, well, we can have this in, in a month. Do you want to wait? Or if you need emergency, maybe you need to go elsewhere. And we get the orders uh, uh, coming in here. What can go wrong here? Uh, and what can go wrong is really, after your credit limit's been passed, is that you lose the order. Uh, that between opening the post, if you like, and then sending the order to the dispatch department of the warehouse, it 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 it, it goes astray somewhere. Uh, so we never make that sale, and we're going to have a really irritated customer. So we need some way of almost capturing these orders as soon as we can, so that uh, there's no chance of them being lost, or if they are lost, at least we spot they've been lost here. Orders coming from your customers uh, are all shapes and sizes, will, will not be consistently numbered. Sometimes what people do when they get orders coming in, they put an order, on, a, no, a number on them. You put your own number on them, uh, 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 which, which is going to be a numerical order. Sometimes what people do is you put them in a, a register, which is just a list of orders. So once they're captured, if you like, in this list, then subsequently what we could do is almost mark off. Yes, we've dispatched the goods. Yes, we've sent the invoice. Yes, we've got we've got the uh, the cash from that coming in. But we want to capture uh, the information about this order or the existence of the order as soon as we can. The orders uh, may be in several parts, but the orders really. Uh, probably going to go up to the dispatch department uh, here and we're going to raise what's called a dispatch note so uh, the order is if you like the almost authorization that at some stage we're going to dispatch the goods so the sales department may raise a dispatch note nice segregation of duties here uh, the Dispatch, physical dispatch is actually going to be held by the warehouse, uh, carried out by the warehouse, but the authorization to dispatch the dispatch note is raised by somebody else. So as the warehouse gets this dispatch note saying we want 10 of those, 12 of those, 20 of those, and so on, and the uh, people in the warehouse will, if you make, make up the parcel, this is called picking the goods, and then they pack the goods. So they pick the goods and they pack the goods. Again, what could go wrong? Well, they might pick and pack the wrong goods. Uh, how can we prevent that? Well, again, it, it's quite common within warehouses for one person to, to do the picking and packing and a second person to be the checker. I quite often get goods from, say, Amazon, where there's kind of two ticks or two sets of initials. Uh, for the two people who was involved in that. Another danger at this stage is here we have inventory leaving the factory or leaving the warehouse. Uh, these are, this is assets going out. Uh, and there's obviously a, a danger that uh, people um, pack goods that have never been ordered. Uh, and that this is dispatched to a name and address uh, of their friends and relatives and so on. So, so what is quite common is uh, on uh, dispatch sides of factories and warehouses, uh, there is gate security. Uh, and as lorries and parcels are leaving, there is a set of security uh, people who ensure that on each parcel has been stuck a copy of the dispatch note. And the only way people could, of course, get dispatch notes is if it came uh, was properly raised, if you like, in the order department, and there's going to be an order backing that up. What we want to see uh, is, ideally, on copy dispatch notes, the original order from the, the customer kind of pinned to that. So we know we have the order, we know the there is a dispatch note there. The dispatch notes uh, should be raised in numerical order. So you can put in some extra dispatch notes that don't have an order uh, for them and, and the like. So we've got the order. We have the order from people who are credit worthy. Uh, we've taken some care to make sure the right goods have been picked and packed uh, and only the right goods kind of escape from the, uh, the custody 
of the company. Uh, we have cut down the possibility of people picking and packing goods and sending them to themselves because there has to be some sort of authorised dispatch note att attached to those. The biggest danger now is that having dealt with the orders in the dispatch properly, we f for some reason forget to invoice or do not invoice. And this is almost the worst sin you can commit on the sales system. Uh, you dispatch goods which are never going to be invoiced. How do we ensure that for every dispatch there is an invoice? Because without the invoice we're never going to get paid. Uh, and quite often the way it works uh, is that when the dispatch note is raised and invoice is raised at the same time, uh, so, so you have a kind of multiple document here, uh, there may be several kind of dispatch notes and delivery notes because usually a copy of the dispatch note will go with the goods to the customer who will then sign that and this is evidence now that the customer has got the goods and, and so on, the customer can't come and complain that the goods are missing and you've invoiced me. So here we have maybe invoice, dispatch note, dispatch note, a delivery note going to the customer here. On the invoice you will have the uh, the full value of the goods. You've got the, the addresses and the descriptions of the goods there and so on there. there. You generally don't want uh, people delivering the goods to see the value. So all you do uh, is you simply don't make, don't allow the the value to come through. So so what you tend to have here is sometimes they have kind of kind of it, it's made kind of black so printing doesn't come 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 through when it's printed. So so now and then all of the same number. So it'll be invoice, you know, one thousand, it'll be dispatch note the one thousand, it'll be delivery note one thousand. And as this is being, being all raised together, uh, there is no chance of an invoice at least being raised. And there may be, uh, you know, another invoice, there may be two kind of invoices, a copy invoice. One goes off to the customer and then one goes to the accounting department. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to debit the customer's account. And it's perfectly possible to all sorts of kind of controls in here. We have a sales day book here. Uh, a sales day book uh, where you would list all the invoices for sales. Uh, the total of the sales day book should equal the total of the invoices which you debit to people's accounts. What should we be doing here is we should be reconciling the control account. Uh, what we'll be doing uh, here uh, is uh, uh, also, we'll be sending out statements. To our customers. Uh, and uh, if the customers disagree with uh, this, then the uh, customers will complain. Uh, and this is a way of spotting perhaps if we've debited to the wrong amount, the wrong amount to, to the wrong uh, 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 person. What else can we do? in here. Well, there's credit control. What we need is some system which follows up long outstanding invoices. Uh, we aged debtors analyses, uh, people maybe who haven't paid an amount for two months. You give them a kind of phone call, some sort of procedures in place for making sure that they pay. The cash uh, uh, will eventually come in. Uh, and when the cash comes in, we want to make sure that it is debited to the cash book and is credited to the right uh, account. Uh, you will have uh, entries in the cash book saying from whom this amount of cash was received. And you'll have to trace all the way back then. This cash comes from this invoice and this, this account. And that invoice was raised because of that dispatch. And that dispatch was raised uh, because we got that order. OK, we've looked at the sales and purchases systems in some detail. We'll go a bit faster through the remaining systems, wages, inventory, cash, capital expenditure. Because you've got the idea. You're thinking, uh, what can go wrong? How can we prevent it? How can we detect it? How can we work in authorizations and reconciliations and the like? 
So the wages system, uh, wage and salary system, it should start first of all with an authorization required to hire people. You can't uh, hope really to run a business well if managers just go out without any sort of authorization from the board, begin hiring people because wages and salaries are a very substantial cost. And once people are hired, in some countries it's actually quite difficult to get rid of them again uh, without a lot of compensation being paid. So you have to make sure that there is an authorization to hire somebody, that their salary has been authorized, uh, and later on, maybe a year later, that salary rises are properly authorized as well. And usually that will be by a personnel department, human resources department, which is separate from the wages and salaries department. We have to make sure the correct employees are paid. This used to be a bigger problem when many people were paid cash in envelopes. Uh, and you had to make sure to look at the identity of people as they came to collect their pay. What do you do if someone is uh, absent on payday, is ill, uh, and they authorize a, a colleague to come and pick their pay up? You need to make sure that this person has been legitimately authorized by the person whose money they're picking up. How do we know when people have gone? It's not quite mentioned here, but it's to do with correct employees being paid. What happens if an employee leaves, but that employee's manager doesn't inform the wages and salaries department? Uh, so that person gets a maybe several months worth of pay that they shouldn't have had. There's also a problem of ghost employees, uh, where uh, somebody introduces uh, a, a so-called new employee to the play payroll, but that person doesn't really exist and the money is paid into some other bank account, uh, or basically on a fraudulent basis. The way some of this is, is, is got round is that the payrolls are printed out every year, uh, and uh, printed out by department, by manager, and you distribute the little printout of the payrolls to the people, uh, and these people are asked to sign and say, yes, these six people are part of my team, uh, this is the correct salaries as far as I'm aware, so that uh, we could pick up on perhaps ghost employees or pick up on someone who's still being paid when they actually left. Pay people the right amounts for the work done. We've been talking about this in terms of time sheets and overtime, but clock cards are very common. Some sort of uh, uh, card that you swipe through, a machine records when you get to work, records when you leave work. The big problem with that is how do you know you don't? Someone hasn't been given a, a bunch of uh, these cards. They come in early and swipe through six of them, uh, and then their mates come in much later, and then someone is nominated to be the last to leave. And quite late at night, this person goes out with the six cards and, and so on, inflating everybody's hours and wages. How do you get around that? Well, it, it, maybe it has to be actual physical supervision, observation of people going through, closed circuit televisions, watching people clock in and clock out to make sure that only one card is put through by each of them. Maybe spot checks from time to time that a person who's clocked in is actually clocking in with their card and not somebody else's. Deductions, tax, insurances and the like have to be properly deducted and they have to be paid over promptly to the uh, authorities, and then it amounts have to be promptly paid to the uh, employees. So in some businesses, wage and salaries uh, can be really quite, quite a large expense. Uh, and once again, you need control over the hire of people that are paid the right amounts, the right rate, uh, that they're paid only for the hours worked, only for the hours authorised, that the money goes to the right people, the money goes to the taxation authorities uh, on, on the right dates. The next system uh, we'll uh, look at is capital expenditure. Capital expenditure, the, the, the purchase of non-current assets. Uh, a couple of things about uh, the capital expenditure. First of all, Capital expenditure is often very material. The cost of a piece of machinery or a motor vehicle uh, can easily be the you know the cost of somebody's pay for the whole year. And secondly, capital expenditure just sucks cash out of the business. 
uh, when you buy raw material, at least you hope to, to process it and sell it again. It, it will kind of generate revenue coming in. But capital expenditure, you just get the asset, the asset's going to be sitting there, depreciating for the next five years. It really sucks up cash. And we have to be really careful that the capital expenditure is carefully monitored from a cash flow point of view, that it doesn't cause difficulties for the company. So we have to make sure it's authorised, and most companies will have a capital expenditure budget, which is set in advance. Uh, and what we are doing is we are simply spending up to these budgeted amounts. Uh, because the, the, each part of the expenditure can be quite significant, uh, we want to make sure that the, uh, the right supplier is chosen and that we try to, to get the best possible discount from that supplier. If you're buying a piece of machinery for fifty thousand dollars, then you know a five percent discount is 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 worth having is a significant amount of money, and we have to bargain hard. Uh, we have to place the orders. It then becomes a bit like the purchaser system. We have to raise the order. We have to make sure that the order isn't outstanding too long. We have to follow it up. When the goods come, we have to make sure the right goods have been delivered. That it's the right model and so on. Uh, that if they say they're going to uh, supply spares with it or installation with it, they're actually going to be doing that. We will eventually receive invoices. The invoices should be agreed to the amount on the order. We're going to credit those invoices to the supplier's account, and then we're going to pay that supplier 30 days, 60 days later, whatever the terms are going to be. And what we ought to do regularly then, since non-current assets are essentially a fairly permanent fixture in the business, we ought to undergo, uh, make sure that these assets undergo regular physical inspection. Most businesses for significant non-current assets will go round every year uh, and do a physical inspection to make sure the asset is still to be found, is still being used and so on. Because losing one laptop computer uh, it is really quite a lot of money and it's part of the safeguarding uh, of this or you know if the thing has gone missing to make sure we can bring the non-current assets uh, up to date. Cash system, all I'll say in the cash system we've dealt with quite a bit of it already in the purchases and the sales system. Purchases usually ends up with cash going out. Sales, we hope, ends up with cash coming in. Capital expenditure, wages, cash going out. We, we, we've, we've dealt a lot of the, with the cash system here. All I will say here, really, is that we have to make sure that monies are banked quickly to safeguard against theft or loss. And also, the more money you have in a bank, perhaps the less overdraft interest you're going to be paying. Uh, you get a better picture of what your cash flow position is rather than money kind of sitting around in, in random places all over the place. And finally, the inventory system. Again, we have uh, dealt with quite a bit of this already. Uh, purchases is the receipt of inventory. Sales will normally end up as the dispatch of inventory there. We have to make sure that all inventory movements are authorised. New purchases should be authorised, new dispatches should be authorised. Inventory, when received or dispatched, should be properly recorded. Many businesses keep very detailed records of inventory so that they can see when, you know, the, when the, 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 the amount of inventory goes down and you need to order it. Or if a customer rings up and says, do you have this in stock? You can look at the inventory records and they are reasonably accurate. And as well as being, you know, properly recorded, we should maybe do uh, inventory counts. Some businesses only do them once a year. Other businesses institute what are called cycle counts that you go round the inventory several times a year. Again, this is to make sure the book stock and the physical stock stay uh, equal. And you can, you can even do a kind of stratification there. High value stock, you might count every week. Uh, lower value stock, uh, you maybe count only every month. Uh, so you, you can alter the cycle count frequencies according to the inventory and the troubles you've had in the past. Cut-off must be correct. We'll be coming to look at what cut-off is, is later. But it really means if you've received goods and they're in the inventory at year-end, you ought to set up some sort of liability for those goods. 
we've talked before of the importance of physical uh, 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 guarding against theft and loss, physical guarding against deterioration. You must make sure that goods that maybe go rusty or going to go off in some way are kept in dry conditions or properly refrigerated and so on. You must make sure that goods are safeguarded against theft or, 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 or safeguarded just against waste uh, if people come and ask for more goods than really they should be. We need proper valuation procedures. Uh, we have to make sure that the goods are valued to the lower of their cost and net realizable value uh, for year-end inventory. And we must make sure that the inventory levels are reasonable. If inventory is too high, there's a risk we'll never sell it. Even if we are going to sell it, it means there's an awful lot of cash uh, which is tied up in that inventory. And we're probably paying interest on that cash. If inventory is very high, there's a bigger chance it's going to be damaged or deteriorated. It, it takes just more rental space in which to hold it. You don't want inventory to be too low. Uh, if you run out of inventory, it's very expensive, uh, both in terms of the workforce standing around and being idle, uh, but also you're going to develop a reputation which is very poor. If customers come to you and are repeatedly told, we can't supply that because it's not in stock, then you will soon start losing sales.